What is up, guys, and welcome to another episode of Guarani Vision, the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguayan football in English. As always, I'm Roberto Rojas, and joining me are my two great co-hosts, Federico Perez and Ralph Hanna. And guys, we're coming into a new month. Obviously, a lot of things are changing here in the in the world of sport. I mean, obviously, we were talking just before we went on the air about Dani Vallejo, kind of the, the big Paraguayan athlete that's having a really great run at the U.S. Open, uh, the U.S. Junior uh, U.S. Open for juniors, that is. They are on to the semifinals. And it could be the first time that we see a Paraguayan win a, a Grand Slam at the junior level. I think since Victor Becci, the long time, um, one of the best tennis players, not the greatest tennis player to ever come from Paraguay. So we'll stick to the football in this sense because jo- uh, Ralph and I are obviously talking literally a week removed from the, the big game between Paraguay and Mexico and Atlanta that we both had the fortune of going to. We're going to go into that. We're also going to talk about an incident that occurred at the Defensor de Chaco for bad reasons as well. I mean, obviously there was some drama there and talk about the league action. So let me get Fede in first because man, it's been a crazy week. You would say, I mean, it's been hell. We're speaking for, on a on a day where you know it's probably the craziest day in in UK history in seventy ish years. So yeah, it's uh, it's been crazy so far. You would say um, in all levels in Paraguay. Yeah, I haven't seen you guys in a while. Look at Ralph's beard and his and his hair. They're getting long, man. I haven't seen these guys in like a couple of weeks. They went to see Paraguay play against Mexico. I want to hear all about that experience. Uh, everything that you guys saw in Atlanta, what you guys liked about our national team, we actually won. So you, you guys were kind of our luck, lucky charm. I, I would even say um, it, it was great to, to, to see Paraguay win, uh, obviously. And we have league, league action. Uh, this is heating up the Clausura, the Copa Paraguay, round of 16. We had a whole bunch of games during this week. Yeah, that there was there was a whole bunch of trouble also between Olivia and Libertad. We got to definitely talk about that. But, but yeah, we have plenty... Plenty of games to talk about, review, everything that you can always find here in Guarani Vision. Uh, Roberto, just like every week, a new episode. Absolutely. So let's go straight into it. And obviously that goes into the introduction to my other co-host, Ralph, because obviously here we are talking a week removed from Paraguay's friendly against Mexico. And, you know, Ralph, you can just jump in whenever, because honestly, the whole experience really was, it was fun. It was great. I mean, Paraguay ended up getting a win. Obviously, we were outnumbered tremendously <laughs> i think the the amount of paraguayan fans that i could count was probably in the hundreds if at all compared to 50,000 mexican fans in atlanta and obviously we were very much outnumbered but it wasn't the case what we saw on the pitch where paraguay ended up winning 1-0 thanks to a Delis gonzalez goal it was really uh it was a tight game it was a really tight game it was one of those games where we, we, we saw that we were very much dominated on all ends. I mean, this Mexico side was completely going on guns blazing and all the pressure was on them as well. And, you know, it's just one of those games where, you know, you get outshot in shots, possession, everything really. But I, you know, Ralph, you could take it away on this one. I think I can say I was impressed. I mean, yeah, it wasn't convincing by all extents, but a win is a win and you shouldn't gatekeep that. But I think what we saw on in Atlanta was pretty positive. And a lot of also new names that had made their debuts under Guillermo Barsquelotto are, are starting to impress. Yeah, I mean, we yeah, we got the win, which is the most important thing. In a way, I wish we had done this kind of thing in the qualifiers, right, where we played badly and we couldn't get results. I mean, yeah, the, the biggest positive for sure is Anthony Silva, who was at a great level and made some really key saves throughout the game because it was a game that Mexico dominated in terms of possession. And I think just kind of leaning on the negative a bit, I think what you saw is, is a team that's much better coached by in Mexico for as much as people there, the, the home crowd or the Mexican crowd there in Atlanta did not like Tata Martino, but they have a much more clear identity. Paraguay is still looking for that. We, we were still struggling a little bit to find what you know what exactly are we trying to play what what is our game and and in the end our game was kind of picking off picking up scraps and and trying to get what we can from from direct play and, and it ends up working with, with uh, Carlos Gonzalez doing the that great kind of spin hits the post and then Derlis is there to to follow up so um that was that was kind of the main positive. And oh, the other positive I really thought in that game was Galarza, who finally made his debut. He's been in a few squads, the the Karachiba player. He's he's kind of um, 
not so well known because he hasn't been playing very much in Coritiba, so we weren't sure kind of what level he's at. But he came on, he was very um, intense in the press and he was very good at winning the ball high up and then he has quality when he's on the ball trying to build and make some good combinations. So I thought that was that was really positive. Um, Diego Gomez came on for a little bit as well. He's going to be a really good player once... Once he moves on from Libertad, he's a Libertad at the moment. Let's hope they don't hold on to him for too long because he looks like a very talented midfielder that can do a lot. So, so yeah, those are the positives. I mean, from the other side, I don't know. I thought it was a shame Lorenzo Melgarejo. I don't think he took his chance. He's been playing so well. We're going to talk about him soon, and I'm sure about last night. He's been playing so well in Paraguay domestically uh, alongside Delis Gonzalez in terms of these two players that you think are too good almost for the league and, and they could go go abroad even though they're in their late 20s. But I just thought Melgarejo looked a bit he looked a bit tired and maybe not on the right wavelength. I don't know what you guys think, but it wasn't it, it, it wasn't like it was his big chance, I thought, to really show that he deserves a regular place in the in the Paraguay national team. And I didn't see him stepping up on that occasion. Yeah, well, I definitely want to talk about some players. And, you know, this this was a test for some of these guys, just like you were saying, Rob, Lorenzo Melgarejo. I, I would even say for Carlos Gonzalez, also our, our center forward. I think we're still trying to look for that center forward, that, that we're still missing that piece. You, you know, I even think that lately our best games have been without that center forward, just having Derlis Gonzalez play up there and, and put more midfielders. But, yeah, we're, we're starting to see a, a certain base of players that, that's just repeating and repeating, right? I mean, Anthony Silva is the goalkeeper. He's going to keep on being the goalkeeper as long as he can play. Uh, he's a star in the Mexican League, and, and he's, doing it, uh, he's doing it just perfect in the national team. And he has nobody behind him, to be honest, in the same level. So uh, I, I see him in that, in that goal uh, position for a while. And uh, the defense was totally new. I really liked the level that I saw from Mateo Gamarra. I think he really took the, his chance uh, as a left back. And he's not really a left back. He's actually a center back. But, but he can, you can use him there, especially uh, on, a, on a team like ours, where you don't usually put left backs that are always attacking. You sometimes need uh, a, a defensive player there by the side. And I think Mateo Gamarra is one of those uh, important players that you can use and he's very young still. He's, he's one of the, the bright new players that we've seen this season. And then you have that midfield with Richard Ortiz and, uh, and Andres Cubas. I mean, those are the same names that we saw in Asia in, in, the, last, in the last friendlies that, that the national team played. So uh, apparently, Celoto is kind of finding uh, the base uh, of his team. You know, he's kind of finding those players to, to, to start moving the, the, the rest around. Derlis Gonzalez also. I mean, Derlis, Derlis is playing really well. These two games that he's come back, uh, three with this one against Mexico. He's been one of the most important players in our in our team. And then, yeah, just like you said, Lorenzo Magarejo probably uh, didn't uh, he, he didn't do much in the game. I was expecting for him to get a couple of shots at goal, but how many times did we actually shoot at goal? Just once or twice, maybe uh, against Mexico that had about twenty shots at, uh, during the game. So yeah, it was kind of the downfall just to see some players not take uh, advantage of the situation. Richard Sanchez also he started he started the game, but I, I didn't see much out of him. Uh, you know, as an offensive player, you, you kind of want to see him uh, make a lot in that midfield. And I, I really like what I saw from Matias Galarza, Diego Gomez. These are really young players. I think we're going to see a lot more from them, Roberto. This is just the first step for them, but. The best thing, and I, 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 I'm sure you guys probably appreciate it even more. It was the it, it was the win. Uh, after 90 minutes, we saw it in the players and the coaching staff. I mean, they were so happy to even win a game. You know, this was the first step for them. They kind of needed that. We couldn't do it against uh, against Korea last time around. We, we were so close to beating them, and we really needed a win, Roberto. So it wasn't all about seeing the young players. It was also about winning and beating a team that's going to the next World Cup. Absolutely. And everyone can say, oh, but this was an alternative side for Mexico. I mean, it's still coached by a, a team that's still going to the World Cup. So it's a it's a big thing. It really is. And yeah, I mean, obviously, two shots on, on like I mentioned in the chat, two shots, one of them being the goal itself. So yeah, not to really go and say we've dominated on a statistical standpoint, but I think we're starting to see signs. Now, obviously, we're going to have to wait and see how this kind of gets um, 
returned into the friendlies in Europe where they take on the UAE and Morocco, where we get a stronger team, where we're going to get more stronger players on that one. So it's 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 going to be interesting to see what happens on there. I mean, Ralph, I mean, going back to you on this one, I think Skeloto can really utilize that those matches as really to find his base of players and, and to utilize it. Because again, they're not going to play any competitive football until at least 2024. So this is now the time to really utilize his base to to work out what needs to go in and what doesn't. Yeah, exactly. He can use some of the, the guys from this from this trip and think who he wants to take with him to to Europe for the for those two friendlies you mentioned, because then we'll see a few other people in. We're talking about a center forward. I mean, there we would have the option of, of Sanabria, who's who's obviously playing Serie A. Then in, in terms of left back or, or defensive players that are left footed, you have Alderete who's playing in Getafe. So you have a few, a few kind of names that are in the top five leagues. And of course, we'll hopefully see Julio and Ciso there to partnering, maybe partnering with Delis Gonzalez. So well, we can see that. And instead of having a big center forward, may, maybe we'll play with these two kind of runners and, and quicker players. But yeah, this has given him a good, I think a good idea of, because you have players that perform well domestically or this side of the world, but you're not sure how they would step up when the intensity is a bit higher. How will they do in these these huge stadiums with with basically they were playing we we were playing as an away team because of the the support that Mexico had. So I think it was a it was a really good test in that in that respect. And I'm glad uh, to, I know we mentioned him already, but I'm glad that Galarza did get that chance and we finally saw what he's what he's doing, because I think that's somebody that was identified by Baros Piloto as, as a player he wants to use. So if he's going to start building a team around players, well, then this is one of his, you can see this is one of his early picks and, and people that he's trusted, because although he hadn't played him before, he'd been taking him to the into the squads, yeah, despite not getting much first team football over there in, in Brazil. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. And then, and then don't forget, we've got in... I guess in a few months now in, in January is the under 20s, the Sudamericano, and that can often be a really good feeder and start to get a feel of those players that could be good enough to then step up for the nationals because we're talking about 2026, the next World Cup. So you have some under 20s there that, that would be hopefully breaking through by, by World Cup time. Absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to make a last note, just, just non-playing wise about it. You mentioned it was good fun. I mean, it was really great to see the Paraguayan supporters out there. We chatted to a bunch, like from different people that have come from Florida, like myself, people that have come from, from Connecticut. I think Maryland was somebody. Um, we met some people that were being Paraguayan for the night. So, so some Chileans and Venezuelans that through partners, Roberto's friend. Um, as well so like through through other people they've been adopted into the Paraguayan family because we needed as much support as we could get so that was, it was really nice and we got to chat to people and and talk to talk to a lot of people after the game and that kind of thing so it's it's great to to have that in-person experience because a lot of us have been missing that for because of the pandemic and everything like Roberta and I we hadn't even seen each other I think since the pandemic like in person so it's great that these events are happening so close to home and let's hope we get another friendly soon out there in the somewhere in the u.s that we can all meet up and go to yeah shout out to my friend marquise uh, obviously one of my childhood friends uh, he lives in atlanta and i made him into an adopted paraguayan he was able actually to meet some of the players saw the coach we got some photos together and hell now he wants to come to paraguay so Fede, you better hope that you can be a good uh host for him anytime he comes to to the country <laughs> I'm picking up that tour guide job. No problem, guys. Don't don't worry about it. Just just send every, anybody you want over here. I'll, I'll give them the tour around. I'll show them around. No problem. Show, show them the good uh, places. I, I it, <laughs> uh, obviously, obviously, I'll take them to the good places, the safe places. Um, I, I think it was very important to play in that stadium, Roberto. What better motivation to play there? That's going to be one of the stadiums in the next World Cup after Qatar. So for our national players to be there in front of fifty thousand fans and win a game in U.S. solo, I, I think that's very important. I, I think it's a very uh, good step uh, forward uh, into what we're trying to build. Even though, you know, yeah, they had the, they had the possession. It was 70-30. They shot way more. 
We're still very far away from being the best team in South America, but hey, we're trying to be competitive. We're trying to build something. That's the situation. That's the reality right now of our national team, the Adi Roja. Yeah, obviously some stats here. First win against Mexico since 2007 with Tata Martino at the helm. First win in USO since 2011 as well. So it's it's been a while. It's been a while since this happened. So at least we can get some joy from this. But uh, yeah, just switching gears now to from a positive experience to a negative one. Obviously, we're talking literally 24 hours removed from the Copa Paraguay game between Olimpia Libertad. Obviously, a big game in itself, given the fact that these two teams are very much successful, the, the, the black and white derby, as they say over there. But obviously, has increased a lot of tension recently because of, obviously, Roque Santa Cruz leaving Olimpia, going to Libertad, and Libertad were just absolutely unplayable really they dominated the first half scoring four in the first half but that was all deemed irrelevant when the game was suspended twice due to fan violence um you know obviously a lot of connections and in a, in a country that i think is obviously you know politically very much burnt out by the likes of a horacio cartes and and just looking at obviously some issues from a refereeing standpoint i mean fed it I could talk to you about this first because obviously you're there. It really has been a situation where, you know, you don't see something like this. I mean, yeah, you do see games being suspended, but twice and because of fan violence. I mean, honestly, like it, it just it just puts in a bad reputation for all of us to see this happen, especially given the fact that, you know, all of this really is coming about because of political situations. Yeah, it's never good to see violence or and mixed things there in 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 a stadium, right? It, it wasn't just football. It wasn't just about football. You just said it was about politics. It's about the rivalry that has heated up lately in these last couple of years. I think it's that this rivalry between uh, Olympia Libertad has been even more between these two teams than than we're accustomed to see, and and, and even more be, in between Cerro Porteño and Olympia, which are the classic rivals here. But, but yeah, this situation between the Olympia and Libertad, Olympia had had their president banned also, and they kind of blamed that on 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 Libertad. Uh, Libertad took one of their stars, Roque Santa Cruz. Roque had a couple of words before before the game, saying that it was kind of going to be a practice uh, for them. So the Olympia fans did not like that. And then there was uh, the ref also. Uh, Olympia did not want Julia Dosa to be the ref of this match, and uh, the FA put him on this game and then there was a, a penalty call, a red card for the goalkeeper and it, it just went off there, right? After uh, after Olympia really had a lot of trouble, a, a lot of errors back there in, in defense, they, they kind of give away three out of the four goals that Libertad made last night. So they kind of made it easy for Libertad, I believe. And, you know, in, in the game itself, I mean, Libertad was being way much, be much better team. And I do think in, in a sense, o Olympia was not liking that, that, that they were being uh, outscored, especially. And, and you know, the, their fans, uh, unfortunately, that's the, just the way it happens here. I mean, we've seen it so many times that, you know, when the hooligans want to stop the games, they do it. When, when, when they want to run the show, they do it. When they want to do what, what they, whatever they want with the police, they do it. And they did it once again, Roberto. And, you know, Paraguay wants to, wants to have a World Cup here in a couple of years, in 2030. And you see all these violence. You see the police not being able to take care of the job, uh, keep people calm. And the, the stadium was not full. And it really got out of hand. You saw families being, being, being taken out of the stadium. Uh, people... Uh, trying to get out of the stands how, uh, any way they could. So it, it was not a good image, you know, for a cup of Paraguay, for the Paraguay football. It's not what you want to see, especially the game was not uh, able to end. So, yeah, Libertad was winning 4-0, but it, it wasn't about football last night in the Copa Paraguay. That's that's the shame in it all. Yeah, it was, it was really sad scenes to see after... I was trying to remember the last time we saw this, I think is when also Olympia traveled uh, to Pedro Juan Caballero. They had a game suspended when there was a, a gunshot in the crowd. Um, and that, I mean, of course we had the pandemic, so there was closed doors for a long time, but it, it just seems that we haven't had this issue for a long time. Um, we, we've had some issues with Luqueño, I remember. I remember Cerro and Guarani about 10 years ago had a similar rivalry where 
Cerro were taking place and Guarani and the two presidents were always like at each other in the press and that kind of spilled over into the fans. And that's what we're seeing now because Olympia's Remember president... Remember that episode where, when, when Olympia went to Guarani Stadium and they took their trophies? And they, and they stole the, the trophies, the... yeah. That was yeah. another one, Ralph. Yeah. That, yeah, so that's what, five, six years ago though. So it, it, it's not that it happens that often, but when it happens, it, it's very sad because we, well, Roberto and I had friends that are over from England and in Paraguay for the first time. So that was their first experience of Paraguayan football in the stadium. So that's a, that's not great um, kind of as a, as an image. And then what, I, what is more worrying is I think the people ultimately in charge of the organization and the safety is the, the APF, the, the Paraguayan FA. And they put this game at 8 PM, of course, for so in some respect for TV, but they weren't really thinking of the, the implications of having a, a game at night, but we're, knowing that there was this kind of thing, this whole thing's been brewing up now for a year or two years. Um, and then they, even though it was in the national stadium, they didn't seem to have the right policing because I mean, at the very least, you have to correctly police between the, the two sets of fans. And it was too easy for the Olympia Barra to just go into where the Libertad fans were and, and start kind of chasing them off. And what you saw was, was people just had to start leaving the stadium. And then outside the stadium, the policemen are ready and you had kind of running battles going on outside of the stadium as well while the game was being played inside. And of course, in the era of social media, everybody outside, outside of the stadium knew what was going on and the players just were playing on. And it was, it was kind of a, a, a surreal scene because it was like that game should have been suspended Really, it shouldn't have restarted because the trouble really kicks off at halftime. So the game just didn't need to, to go underway. And I don't know why there was so much insisting on, on playing, but <clears throat> whatever happens, I mean, now it's it's been suspended. I don't think they will have to replay the, the final minutes. I would just give Libertad a pass and think, I think Olympia themselves will be happy with that so they don't have that extra game time. Um, but yeah, it's it's a shame to see this happening again and and it's so many factors like you were talking about Fede it was like the, the referee selection the time of the game the the political situation for people that don't know Paraguay there's an election next year and uh, and so of course there's a huge kind of political feeling in the country at the moment there's there's lots of things going on with the US government have been um threatening with with uh, extradition for people involved in politics which includes people involved in football like Horacio Cartes so there's there's been kind of so much going on behind the scenes and I think football kind of almost got caught in the in the crossfire with it last night yeah and, and it was just, and it wasn't the only time they happened this year Roberto I mean we have to go back to the apertura and remind people what happened between Cerro Porteño and Libertad I mean in most of the big matches uh, Libertad has has had the advantage of, of having to send off a, a rival, you know, with the red card. That happened against Cerro. It happened now against Olympia. So there's these goals going around that Libertad has an advantage, that, that Libertad has help to, to, to get the trophies and to get the wins. They have a great team. But, you know, yeah, when, when all this reputation and, and all the rumors are around the ref and, and around the games, uh, obviously the big teams do not want to lose against Libertad and Cerro and Olympia had trouble with this team this year. Absolutely. That, that's the thing. And, you know, I think it's it's a demonstration, unfortunately, of how far we have to go until we reach certainly a a, a envi an environment really where you can be safe to go to these games. And, you know, I, I get it. Football is passionate there. And, and, you know, sometimes it gets to a lot of people, but there are limits to everything. And, you know, unfortunately, when everything fails, it just makes it a big mess. And so, yeah, I mean, we're going to see what happens. I don't see this rivalry dying down anytime soon, but at least from what we saw from the Thought, and this is kind of going into now the last segment, really talking about the league, because obviously looking at how the, the Clausura is right now, um, you know, all these teams are still fighting for it. Olympia are, of course, still top of the table with 19 points. Nacional in second it with 18. Zero Porteño. Uh, with 18 points as well, getting a, a, a an important win against Libertad, actually, who have been falling off as well. So, I mean, Ralph, going to you on this one, you know, it, it, this these type of games are only just going to make these matches very much more intense, really, because there's just so much on the line. And, 
yeah, I mean, bad blood between everyone trying to to knock the red thought off their perch to win this thing, to win this. Yeah, 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 and they've been so good. They they usually average, I think, it's like two point three, two point four goals per game. Like they're scoring, so for them, it's common to score over two goals a game. How do you really stop that? Well, a couple of teams have beaten them three two, which is one way. But the, the match against Cerro at the weekend was was really very strange to see Libertad not score a goal. I, I was checking it before we came on. It was only, I think, it's the third time in 22 games, at least league games, they haven't scored. And two of those are against Cerro because one was the 4-0, the, the Cerro won uh, last season in a very strange match. And then there was this one nil and I can't remember the other team they didn't score against, but it's just very, Oh, Emiliano at the beginning of the season. So it's really rare that, that you see a game like this, but then from Cerro's point of view, that was a almost a classic Cerro Porteño game that we've seen on the Chiquiase when they are just been very strong defensively, but not always uh, good enough going forward and, and not very coordinated. And in the end, the, the goal that comes is a is kind of a fluke own goal by Boca Negra because he's he's trying to head the ball and he sort of loops the header over the goalkeeper. Um, and it was about the third or fourth cross into the box that Libertad just hadn't dealt with very well in that passage of play. So, so it's almost self-inflicted. I, I don't think Cerro did that much. But what Cerro did really well is they defended that game very well. And that's been the base of that of this this team right they they don't score many but they have a really good defense and they say defense wins championships so so that's what Cerro and Chiquiasi seem to be to be banking on again it was Alexis Duarte playing playing very well in defense um, and just having that that team that whole kind of organization so so that was really good for Cerro to throw them into the title race and then the other team that won one nil to keep in the title race is Nacional so don't don't sleep on Nacional because they're still there, just one point behind Olympia. And Nacional finally beat Taquari, who, who were on a great run and, and hadn't lost. Um, and what we're seeing was really interesting, I think, with Nacional is they, they have this guy, Facundo Bruera, who's a great young striker, but he started to go off form and he was finding, like, not finding the net. And so he has been on the bench for the last few games. But he's now in the last two games, has come off the bench and scored. So he's like rebuilding his confidence. And I think the manager of Nacional Saravia has done really well in managing him and managing and, and getting him his confidence levels back up. And so let's, we shouldn't count them out as well. I think we've really got four teams as we're heading into the halfway stage of the Klaus Soto. We've really got four teams that could do something because Libertad are three points off the lead now, three points behind Olympia. But as we've been talking, Libertad are such a strong side. They can make that up very easily. Yeah, I'm thinking. If I was to, to to talk about which team is playing better right now, I, I would say Libertad. To be honest, uh, I think Libertad is the team that's playing their best football, and they're probably the team to beat. But 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 you have so many good teams in in this Clausura. You guys were just talking about what Taquari is doing with with a, with a team that's playing really well. I think they they can mess up anybody's game and Nacional also and then you have the teams that are playing for relegation spots they can take anything away from you at any given moment of the tournament there's so many games still ahead of us but it's good it's healthy for the tournament that we have three four teams at least going up against each other our tournament is not it's not that long we don't have that many teams so to see it kind of tied up and not just be about one or two teams like it usually is it, it, I think it's going to make it uh, a title race a, a lot more fun than what we're used to uh, Roberto so I'm really looking forward to the second part of this tournament just because we're almost halfway there already yeah yes we are we're getting into the nitty-gritty obviously you know titles can always be decided at the last minute as we saw last year in the clausura so we'll definitely have to wait and see what happens but yeah I think it's it's the case where we see it week to week where you need these type of teams to be consistent and, you know, you, you can't switch it off. And like I said, I'd imagine Olympia after what happens in the midweek, they're going to be more motivated than ever to try to win games, especially to win this title. I mean, they definitely want it. And what better way to do it to send a, a big middle finger to Libertad, who has kind of been on their, on their, on their butts really to try to, to mess up with them. I mean, that, that that's kind of how I see it, Fede and Rob. I mean, I don't know what you guys think, but it'd be the good way for them to, to stop kind of the, 
the dominating team of Paraguay football. Yeah, I mean, Olympia are well motivated and, and in Julio Cesar Caceres, they have a guy that as a player won a lot of trophies. And if you remember when he first came in to Olympia, he managed to win the, the Copa Paraguay and the, the Supercopa, right? He, ma he managed to kind of salvage their, their season when he first came in. So he's a, he's a guy like a win at all costs, I think, kind of person. So I'm sure they're, they're, they're very motivated. And by what happened midweek, they won't be happy with the way they went down so easily in that first half. So I'm, I'm sure we'll see them. I, I would expect them to win this weekend to bounce back, which means they'll stay on top and they'll be top kind of heading into that halfway stage. I, I think the big difference right now is just having a healthy roster and uh, uh, Cerro does not have that yet. I mean, they've lost their, their center forward in these last couple of games. The Bolivian Marcelo Moreno Martins, he's kind of been absence so, uh, and Claudio Aquino also. So Cerro needs to get back all the players, get them healthy, uh, try to get back to their starting 11, which is a team that we haven't seen lately. Uh, and I think Cerro is going uh, gonna to have good games ahead of them. Uh, I think this, this last win against Libertad is just what they needed. It kind of chill the people and kind of calm everybody down. And so they could work uh, better. And, and try to end the year the best way possible. I, I'm looking forward to the games that are coming up, Roberto. I think the, the title is going to decide itself on those last games. I don't think we're going to have a champion uh, several weeks before the tournament is over. I, I think this was going to be a tight one, this close to Yeah, absolutely. And we're just going to have to wait and see what happens here as we close out another great episode of Guadalupe Vision. For myself, Roberto Rojas, Fede Perez, and Ralph Hanna, thank you so much for listening in. See you soon. <laughs>